Really sorry, folks. I think I was kicked out there and then news roll kicked out. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah I think I, I lost, I get clicked out as well. Um, sorry, I think that's everyone back in now. Um, okay. Doesn't we'll usually do that. It. Yeah, sorry about that. Jim, we, we lost you maybe a minute or two yeah. back there. <laughs> if you... So I, I, I'm going to take 30 seconds to, to round off and hand over to Claire. Um, okay. I was just making a final point, Paul, which was to say if ever I forget about why this, this whole agenda is integral or foundational, I, I think about the work we did in the Edinburgh Poverty Commission, which was over two years and involved over a thousand conversations um, throughout the city. Um, actually, the one thing everyone agreed on in those conversations was fixing the housing crisis in Edinburgh. But I give that example because of the number of times we heard from um, people living in, in our capital city on a low income, for whom poverty was not just about material hardship, it was about stigma, it was about feeling locked out of the life of the city, and it was about the experience of being passed from pillar to post by multiple services, all of which want to assess, refer, and then hand you over to the next service. And people told us about being exhausted and actually no longer wishing to be part of that game and finding in grassroots charities alternative solutions which go with the grain of people's lives, which stick with you patiently um, until your basic needs have been met. We're talking about housing, education, social security, and then finding we've got actually lots of very powerful solutions to many day-to-day -day challenges if only we design them in ways that work with people's lives and if only we do more than just meet needs but also address um, the goals people have got to move on in their lives. Um, and so, you know, let's stop um, trying to just join up service land and let's really listen to what people are asking for and, and more and more demanding as of right in terms of the support and services that are going to enable them to move on in their lives. So I'm going to pause there and hand over to Claire, who will tell you about our Each and Every Child programme. Thanks, Claire. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jim. Over to you, Claire. Thanks, Jim. And I am just... Can I get a wee thumbs up, Jim? Because you're the only person I can see. Can everybody see that? Marvellous. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Jim said, I'm Claire O'Hara, Programme Director of Each and Every Child. Um, we're at a pivotal moment right now in Scotland with the Independent Care Review, the Promise, the Plan 21-24 and the Change Programme. Scotland has stepped up to reimagine care experience for children, young people and their families. And this is groundbreaking work. This is policy and practice that can and will change lives. And how we talk about care experience matters. From telling our stories to working with families, there's a growing body of evidence that what we say and how we say it changes how people think, feel and act. I'm going to share some, co some of the co-design work that we're currently doing with people who have lived experience of care. But first, I'm just going to give you a bit of background to the initiative to set it in a context. So in 2017, the Frameworks Institute was funded by Robertson Trust, Celsius and Life Changes Trust. And it was tasked with carrying out extensive research into public attitudes towards young people within the care system. And from this, we produced two reports, slipping through the cracks and seeing and shifting the roots of opinion. And this research included people from the workforce, people with lived experience of care, policymakers, and in turn, the general public. 
And what this research has enabled us to do was better understand what were the challenges for us that wish to campaign and advocate for change towards supporting children, young people and their families within the care system. So the three key communication challenges that were highlighted by the research was first and foremost, children and young people with experience of the care system are seen as forever damaged or as a result of factors such as trauma and neglect. And that damage done can't be undone. The second challenge that we have is that the care system is viewed as dysfunctional and unable to provide the loving, nurturing care that children and young people need to thrive. And finally, and probably the most challenging, is that the public consider children and young people generally end up in the care system due to bad, poor parenting and bad choices. And by bad choices, I mean when we have babies, toddlers, very young children come into the care system, the public have a lot of understanding and support that we need to love and nurture our children. However, as children get that bit older and from as young as the age of 10, that attitude flips to an attitude of blame. These young people are in care because of something that they've done. So phase two of the programme focused on testing reframing strategies and these reframing strategies, how we can talk about care experience to counteract these key communication challenges within the public. And these frames were tested in 2019 and refined using three methods, on the street interviews, survey experiments and peer discourse sessions. It's important to note that people with lived experience of care were included in all parts of the research from the very beginning right through to the trial and testing of the reframing strategies. And now we are in stage three, which is each and every child initiative. And we have three aims. First and foremost, we want to shift public attitudes towards children, young people and their families who are in and around the care system. We want to engage and inform professionals within the sector who work with children, young people and their families around their communication so that we can strengthen their practice and their impact. And then finally, and most importantly, support and equip people with lived experience of care to be at the heart of efforts to develop a more consistent and effective communication so that we can mobilise people within the, our communities and across the country to take action to improve the life chances of our children and young people. And it's vital for us that people with lived experience of care, of care are central to this movement to build the support for the progressive policies and to positively shift those public attitudes. So to do this, each and every child is working alongside people with lived experience of care. And we've got two particular roles. Firstly, we've got our management group, which is a strategic role. And in our management group, we have representatives from our funders, who I won't name, and um, please don't tell on me. Um, we also have the Promise Scotland, and most importantly, we have two paid consultants with lived experience of care who sit at a strategic point within our organisation. Um, and they're not just ha bringing their lived experience of care, but they've also got professional experience as their specialists in trauma responsive practice and also participation. So that's our strategic role. And then we have an operational role where we are working hand in hand with people with lived experience of care. So we've got what we call our Voices of Experience Reference Group. And we have brought together a group again of paid consultants with different experiences of care, different ages and at different points in their life. And when we talk about the sector, we mean people with lived experience of care, people who work to support children and families directly, directly, both third sector and statutory, corporate parents, policymakers, and politicians. For me, co-design is a social movement. I believe like many others across the country, if we value both professional and lived experience equally, we can create compassionate systems that support every member of our society to feel included and to flourish. 
So I'm going to share some of the journey that we've been on in the pre-planning stages of setting up our Voices of Experience reference group. We had to look at design tools. And when we are talking about co-design, we need to ensure that it's social design that's sensitive to power and trauma. So first and foremost, we looked at a trauma responsive approach. Myself and Michael, who's the other member of my team, we are a very small team. We initially went through the NEST training and trauma responsive practice. This is great, it's free, it's online, NHS Scotland, I would recommend it to anyone. And from this, we created a trauma responsive approach document that we used the learning and understanding that we gained from the training. We also worked with the care consultants and our management group to finesse the approach to ensure that all the work that we were doing was grounded in the six principles of trauma responsive practice, choice, collaboration, empowerment, trust, safety and culture. Then we had to look at our power and privilege of the staff that were involved in the co-design group. In co-design, we're aiming to go beyond discussing and making recommendations about what we could and should happen. What we want to do in co-design is to test and implement new approaches to create better outcomes. So for us, this wasn't just about people in the group advising or commenting on the materials, but how do we make that approach to a wider delivery to the wider community of people with lived experience? We had to explore our own power and privilege um, as staff members. And it's not just about looking at that at the beginning, throughout the whole co-design process, it's a question that we are constantly coming back to of where is the power balance within the group? Um, are we all making decisions collectively together or is that, that imbalance there? The fourth thing we looked, the third thing, sorry, we looked at was remuneration. I think it's really important that when we are working in co-design, we are asking people with lived experience of care to bring their knowledge and expertise to the table. And if they are shaping our service delivery, they're an expert and like any management consultant, um, I think it's really important that we should be, when it's possible, to pay. Now, I know that can be a challenge, particularly if you've got small budgets, but what um, I would say is look at your budget, reassess your budget. If we're talking about proper co-design, we need to look at what we're spending money on. So for myself, what I done was looked at the different budget allocations I had, and I moved money from the staff development allocation because I felt that the learning that we were going to gain from our members with lived experience was professional development. I also looked at our marketing and communication budget. The quality of the work that we were going to produce through the co-design, that was going to help build our reputation. And our reputation would enhance word of mouth promotion. So it was looking at specific things within the budget and saying, actually, this money is better spent on paying people for their expertise. I am aware that not everyone has that luxury. So what I would say is think about what are the professional development experiences that you're offering? Are they accredited? Will it give members of your group the professional experiences and opportunities to build a network that suits their own personal ambitions and dreams? And then finally, it was looking at recruitment. So throughout the project, we wanted to make ensure that lived experience care of care was at the centre of everything. So first and foremost, at the research point, we were looking for people with lived experience of care who were well-known advocates and campaigners, but who also had experience of communication through marketing, journalism, facilitation, and represented the wider community of care experience. So we worked um, at that point with Who Cares Scotland, then when it came to the management group, again, we were looking for people with lived experience of care, but also experience of working alongside others to create change. And then finally, with our Voices of Experience reference group, 
we were wanting to create a group that had diversity of care experience, people who had been experienced of different care settings, be that foster care, kinship, cared for at home, or indeed um, were brought up in a children's house. So we also wanted a, a diversity in our age, gender and ethnic background. So first and foremost, I revisited the applications for people that had applied for a role within the management group. I also contacted someone who'd been involved in the initial research. And then I went onto Twitter. Um, I don't tweet myself, but I went onto Twitter and started looking at who were people who really challenged the system. Because if we wanted to create a group of co-design about how we improve the service that we were going to deliver, I wanted people who I know were going to challenge us at every point. And then finally, I looked at some young people who were just starting out in their kind of career as advocates and campaigners. The first thing that I'd done was um, met with people individually to speak, to talk them through what would be required from them for a time, a time perspective, a bit more information about the initiative and the staff team. And also most importantly, what they would be required to share within the group. And it was important for me to emphasize it. There was no need for them to go into personal trauma. It was more about experiences of services, what was missing for them so that we could look at that on a wider scale. So co-design in action, first and foremost, the most important part for us is building those relationships and the time that has to go into building those relationships. Like everyone else, we were faced with COVID and the challenges of building relationships online. So again, I went back to the principles of trauma responsive practice. And one of the things that we were doing was sending out materials beforehand and having individual meetings pre bringing the group together so that if anyone had any questions with the materials that we're using so that people felt empowered in meetings and knew what was coming up and there were no surprises. Um, part of relinquishing power when you're building relationships is allowing conversations to happen. And that can be challenging because conversations don't always follow a straight line. They can be messy, sometimes feel a bit meandering. And I had to resist the urge to move these forward as the conversations that we were having had immense value. And within those meanderings, we got some golden nuggets of understanding of how we could design our programme. Then we talked about our aim with the group. We had an initial aim, but we discussed what was missing and added to those aims. And then started the initial work looking at the research. And I think that's really important. We need to empower people when we are working with them to share research and go through it so that they know where we are coming from. And then we had a discussion around the findings. People had a space to respond, question, and there was a lot of questions and discuss. And then we started working through the current materials. What made sense? What was missing? And how did it land? How did these reframing strategies, we have to be very careful because what we are actually doing is giving people tools to share their own story. So we worked through the current materials and then we allowed individual work on some of the recommendations. And that individual work was to allow people the space and time to focus on particular recommendations that they felt really strongly about and supported by staff, they redesigned them. Then we presented and fed back to the wider group. And again, it's about creating that safe space, looking at your power dynamic so that ideas can be shared with that mutual understanding and support. And then we looked at implementation. Who's missing from the conversations about care experience in the care system and how do we reach them? And the fundamental question, why do we want to reach those people who are not engaging in those conversations? Then we talked about the co-facilitation of the sessions that we are now going to roll out across the country and asked if people within the group would be willing to become co-facilitators and do a bit of additional training. And then for the members of the group who are unable to take part in the co-facilitation of sessions, 
We've got an ongoing engagement with them throughout the duration of our initiative so that they can advise and inform from an operational perspective at all points. So what did we learn? <laughs> it's messy. And at times we have to be learn, we have to learn to be comfortable in that space and we have to learn to move away from structure sometimes. Always being aware of the power balance throughout the process. A flexibility in the time skills and approaches to participation. You can come up with a framework for participation and, and engagement, and that changes because people's lives change. So there had to be a flexibility in those time skills. Another big learning was talking to others who were also doing co-design work. There are so many people across Scotland that are brilliant examples. So it was about sharing practice. Co-design is constantly evolving in this country. And the biggest lesson I learned from the members of the group was it's all right for me to challenge if I don't agree. Sometimes um, I'm very sensitive to challenging people, especially if they've got lived experience and I don't. But what the group taught me was if you create the right environment, it's all right to challenge. And the last thing was that if we invest the time, you can actually build those relationships online. It is possible. We finally met after eight sessions. We met for the first time last month face to face and within five minutes of everybody being in the room, that was as if we had known each other for months, years. Um, and what we learned from that was if you invest that trauma responsive practice in that time, you can still build those relationships over time and online. So the next stage is for us, we're still learning. We are still learning on a daily basis. The co-facilitation of sessions, we are now looking at how do we support people to develop those facilitation sessions. And also this is not a short term working group. And initially it was, but the richness that this group have brought to not just how we work with people with lived experience of care, but how we work with professionals and policymakers has been so valuable that we've realised that this group has to continue and the continuous sharing of practice. And I cannot emphasise this enough. Um, we are not the only people at each and every child. Some of the most inspiring organisations that have informed my practice have been Resilience Learning Partnership. CORA Foundation and also Life Changes Trust and the model that they've used for the Children's Champions Boards. I am going to leave you with two quotes. Everybody here knows co-design is about designing with, not for people, but a wee provocation. What if the goal of our social care systems was to learn continuously from and with the people we support? How would that change things? What kind of society can we create through proper co-design? I have to say these provocations aren't mine. They are from Sally Ann McKercher, Beyond Sticky Notes, a book I would highly recommend for anyone who is about to attempt a co-design project. And lastly, these are our contact details. I have shared my presentation with Paul so he can send that out if anybody wants more information, wants to share learning with us or ask any questions. Thanks very much. Thanks Claire, um, absolutely brilliant. Um, so many things in there I'm sure for people to get their teeth into. I'm conscious of time where we're just running a few minutes behind. Um, can I just say that we, we know that some people are having problems with sound and hearing. We're trying to work on that and resolve that. Um, so fingers crossed uh, we'll, we'll get there on that one. And I'm seeing great positive comments coming back, Claire and Jim, on, on what you've been talking so far. So anyway, I'm going to push on and ask Claire from Maternal Health Scotland now to share her experience uh, with us as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, Paul, and thanks very much, uh, Claire. Good name. Um, that was a really fascinating um, 
insight into your work there and each and every child and it's it seems as if you've really done a thorough job um what I've been um, sort of offered uh, to talk about at this session is uh, an experience of mine as participation officer with Maternal Mental Health Scotland and um, working with um, people with lived experience of perinatal mental health problems and at trying to access services. Um, and it's in the context of um, what's called the Programme Board for Perinatal and Infant Mental Health. The Scottish Government has um, a lot of money to spend on perinatal and infant mental health and in the last nine years I've been involved as a volunteer as a person with lived experience of perinatal mental illness um, and then in the last two years as a paid um, lived experience leader participation officer to help um, our group um, sort of express ourselves and be involved in this, this co-design um, so that we came up with the terms of reference the group um, along with the Scottish Government um, and the role of the group is to advise, challenge and work collaboratively with the Programme Board for Perinatal and Infant Mental Health with the views of people with lived experience in mind. So there is a real, there's an appetite for it. Um, people understand that they need to listen to people with um, experiences of services. However, um, it's about doing it properly. And what I've been doing for the last two years is to try and um, share examples of good practice and try and help them to think about what is effective and respectful co-design. So um, there's been lots and lots of things that we do. And one of the things is the Experts by Experience Reference Group. And one of the members of the group um, who is also a midwife and she runs a, an arts um, therapy group for, um, for people, um, we sort of came up with an idea that we would like to explore the experiences of people with lived experience using art um, rather than um, the sort of usual um, focus group um, PDF report that maybe the Scottish government wouldn't necessarily read um, or some people might read it but not everybody. So we applied to the Perinatal and Infant Mental Health Fund, um, which was a, um, a bit of money. Third sector organisations in the main got it to deliver services, but we were awarded £2,800 to do this project. So we asked our, uh, some of our members, our experts by experience group, if they wanted to take part. Um, and they were sent a really lovely group of um, arts materials um, and I participated in the session despite being a sort of um, you know trying to coordinate it I, I participated in it as person with lived experience so I took my hat off and put my hat on um, and what we came up with was a really um, amazing uh, piece of like an art exhibition initially we wanted it to tour all the health boards and all the health boards to see it and see how how these experiences are but then as you know something happened in March 2020 and we can do that um so what we did was we used the money to um build a website so this was done by um Elaine Connell who was the expert by experience member who also facilitated the group and I'm going to sort of scroll through some of the pieces that we came up with um and just a sort of um warning some of the images contain content relating to blood loss birth trauma and also suicide so I just wanted to kind of say that before sharing it in case that might um, affect you so these are some of the the works that came out of the the sessions we met six times we had a chat about we wrote, everyone wrote a poem um, and out of that poetry came our artworks so you can see um at the beginning here, we have some um, kind of experiences of um, exploring my identity post-birth as a person with multiple mental health diagnosis. Um, and she, you, there's a lot of work to do with, you know, eyes and seeing beyond that. Um, the, in the second one here, it, it strays into a more campaigning uh, idea. Um, she used lottery tickets to, she scrumpled them all up and then sort of did a multimedia thing. Um, 
really thinking about the postcode lottery. This woman lives in Grampian um, and at the time, and right now it's getting better, but it's still not good. Um, the perinatal mental health services aren't as good as they should be. It's a postcode lottery. So that was kind of her experience. Um, and <clears throat> I'll kind of scroll down. Um, this one here, Black Moms Matter. So that really um, touched on the Black Lives Matter campaign. Um, black mothers are more likely to suffer from postnatal depression. They're also more, more likely to die in childbirth. Um, and um, we wanted to kind of explore the, um, you know, the experiences of, um, of black mums and kind of raise awareness of it. Um, Oh, Jesus, I'm trying to, I need to go back to the gallery. Um, so it's kind of worth a, a real explore. And the idea um, is that we wanted to tug at the heartstrings of the people who are trying, who are um, delivering services, who are funding services, and really have a think about what happens when you don't properly fund perinatal mental health services people um, are missed, people experience distress, um, people have really good experiences as well. This is um, an embroidered piece about um, being, uh, experiencing care in the mother and baby unit in Glasgow. Um, and it's a, this is mine, it's a map of um, Elder Park because it was away in the Old Southern General um, and that's sort of a, a sewed tea towel. So you can see that um, the, the care that I got from the nurses in there helped me through my journey and that's what we wanted to kind of say. We wanted to talk about good things and bad things. Um, I think I've got a few more minutes so uh, I'll, I'll sort of scroll through them. Um, what we learned from it um, was that um, you get really, really good um, outcomes from engaging people when you put a paintbrush, a pencil, a computer, um, a stick of glue in their hand. Um, they, it helped and it's kind of, they're getting something out of that experience. So you're not just kind of sitting people down and saying, what do you think, what happened to you? Um, they are gaining a peer support network. So the group still talks to each other on WhatsApp all the time. Um, you, it, it helps you connect and it also empowers you to share your experience in a way that you want it to be presented. This sort of thing, this sort of lactating female um, experience of bad breastfeeding um, advice um, probably isn't going to make it into a Scottish government report um, because it's messy, it's, um, you know, not formal. Um, so that, that this is what we kind of wanted to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I would encourage you to have a wee look at the website. We've also done a wee, um, all the things I've said and a lot more because I've rambled quite a lot are on this um, web page. So I'll stick that in the chat and you can have a wee look, um, have a wee look at it as well. Um, it's really lovely to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to, to share our experience of doing that. Um, and I'll look forward to the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Um, ab absolutely brilliant. Um, we're running just a few minutes behind, but we're not bad. Um, so we're, we're now going to put you into breakout rooms. And, and as I mean, there's loads of stuff there that have come from the three speakers. You know, things that struck me were what Jim said about power and shifting the balance and that idea of a right to participate, not an invitation. Um, Claire, first Claire talked about how we reframe strategies, reframe the conversation, have better communication, how we value and work with lived experience and how we do co-design and action. That was fascinating for me just to hear how you make that work in practice. And then lastly, Claire, your, your own experience of maternal health. Um, but I think fascinating as well, that use of art and poetry to allow people to express what issues they face, what's important for them and how they best express their needs and their desires as well. So thank you all three of you. Without further ado, we're going to put you into breakout rooms now until, um, just check my programme very quickly, until 
10 past two. Um, and then we will go straight from that into a short break for five, 10 minutes or so, and we'll come back and pick up uh, the next round of presentations. Please remember if you have questions, use the Mentimeter facility, um, put them, to, uh, put your questions either to individual speakers if you want or to everybody, um, and we'll pick up and, and uh, hopefully cover them later on. So I'll, uh, we're now going to put you into breakout rooms. Thank you again, Jim and the two Claire's for your presentations, great. Thanks very much. Just wait till you're in it. You join room two. Hi folks, I'm just checking to see if everyone's um, okay getting into their room. We're going to excuse ourselves for 10 minutes to go and grab a bit of lunch if that's okay, um, but we'll see you in a bit. SJ, am I able to communicate a message um, just orally to all the people at the moment? No. Into the breakout rooms? The breakouts. No. Um, because I had to make Susan the host. Susan, no, actually we can. Yeah, you can broadcast yeah. message to all. It's just to remind people that there's two questions that they we're asking them to focus on. Um, yeah, I fired them into the chat quickly, but I wasn't sure. Um, I could broadcast a message to them. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone will have access to them questions, Paul. So even if you say there's two questions in the chat for you to think over. There's two people in there. Alex, I'm just checking. Um, are you okay getting into your breakout room? Yeah, I think I've broadcast that. Hopefully people see that and put that up in the break. Yeah, I can see that, Paul. So okay, um, I'm just trying to go back into the initial menti to see if there's anything popped up on that so far. Um, uh, I can see that Alex hasn't joined yet. Chris. Sometimes Zoom does this. It looks like yes. people haven't joined, but no, it's fine. Okay, I see a couple of questions around training. Can I just double check the time that they went in? It was about. It was. 40, it was nearly. It was nearly. 40. Quarter two, just before yeah. quarter two, yeah. 45, okay, so um, I'll be closing the rooms about 3.05, okay. That was an exciting start. SJ, we have different designs on what's exciting. That was worrying. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, good. I'm, I'm kind of wondering why 
as you were saying, SJ, that even if your connection was unstable, why it didn't resort to what, what the money use and 10 co hosts? Because I used definitely got a notification saying that you were co host. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Yeah. I honestly don't know why I did that. And, and so, yeah, so, so I think everybody get put out of the room and then it just did its usual thing of reconnecting. Well, I got chucked out and then it reconnected and it was like 57 people in the waiting room. And I was like, what, what, why? <laughs> so I was like, let them all back in. Well, as, as chair, yeah, I found that quite scary. I suddenly thought, is that my fault? Have I got something wrong here? And I'm, I'm, I'm out. Um, so fortunately, I didn't, uh, you know, didn't get time to totally panic. Yeah, are you going to bring people back then about five past? Yeah, I'll give them a wee warning about uh, okay. five to just saying there's 10 minutes yeah. left. Right, well, we've, we've we, I mean, according to the programme, we've got up to 10 past and then a break for 10 minutes. But it would be good maybe to bring them all back and uh, then say, right, we are going to have a break. Um, I don't think we'll take questions at that point. I don't think we've got time at all. Mm they just open it up when they really want to then have a proper break. So we bring them back just after five past, SJ? Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I would just leave it for a minute to the break, just enough for you to Okay, see. yeah, yeah. I, I think that's, take your yeah. cell phone mute and camera off, please. Um, I, I don't know if everything was up. I could hear everything fine. There was very, <clears throat> when Jim, which I think was at his end, um, kind of broke up. Uh -huh. um, but I heard everything fine and I'm, I'm wondering if that's because I had my camera off um. <laughs> Should I pause the recording? Just yes. Not that we're but just because yeah. it's Okay Bring them back folks Power in a way that they'll listen. Hello. How's it going? Realizing that like, uh, what's going on? Hello again, everyone. Um, I'm just Double checking that we are we still get any more people to come back, yes, Jay? No, I think that's us, Paul. That's us all. Okay, thank you. We might have lost a few people okay. just but um okay. Uh hello again, everyone. Um I, I hope that discussion time was useful for you. Um Apologies, I had to broadcast that wee reminder about the questions that we thought you could focus on, but I'm sure there'll be other things that you wanted to pick up on anyway in your chat. A um, couple of things to mention. We're, we're going to have a break in a minute or so, um, but on the sound issue, we think it might help if when presenters are presenting, if you switch your camera off, that might just help um, deal with some of the problems around sound. So... Um, mm -hmm. I don't think the speakers will get too worried if they're facing a lot of blanks. Um, uh, if that helps just the communication and hearing properly, then that, that would be good. Um, a wee reminder too, maybe if you want to, over the break to make use of the Menti function, if you've got questions that you want to pose, um, 
We've got four or five questions that are already popping up, and um, that's good. That's great. We'll pick them up later on. Um, so I'm looking at my uh, clock, and it's saying 14.07 at the moment. So I'm going to suggest maybe that we were scheduled to have a break now until 14, till 20 past two. I think we'll stick to that. Um, so let's have a break. And if you can rejoin just before 20 past, we'll kick off very sharp then. Um, and we'll pick up discussions afterwards, but we'll come back after the break and hear our next two presentations. Thanks very much, everybody.
just a reminder, it might be useful if you want to switch your cameras off and that way it might make just the sound and uh, hearing the presenters that bit easier. So over to you, Alistair. Thanks. Super. I'm just going to share my screen with you all for one moment. Hopefully, you should now be able to see my slides. Um, as is always the way in these things, and I can't see anybody, so I can't tell if I actually am sharing this or not. Sorry, Alistair. Nope, can't see your side. Come through. Oh, hold on a second. Rookie error here. I haven't pressed the button. How's that? Yeah, that's great now. Good. Super duper. Um, and have, I got, have you got me up on the slideshow view? Yes, you should do. Excellent. Right, so hello, I'm Alistair. I work for the National Lottery Community Fund. I'm a comms and engagement manager. And today I was going to talk a little bit about the kind of journey we're on about being a people-led funder or attempting to be. So tight 10 minutes. So I'll rattle through it. Um, probably won't be talking as in depth and from as much personal experience as some of the other speakers that have talked so far, um, but kind of giving you an overview about what sort of thing we've been doing in the National Lottery Community Fund in Scotland over the last few years and actually looking a bit further back as well. I will start off by looking at our strategic framework, um, probably a phrase that brings dread into the hearts of anyone watching a PowerPoint presentation. I promise I will not mention our strategic framework again, but I'm just going to chuck this in here because it kind of sets out where we are as an organization and for some time we've been working towards this goal of this this vision of when people are in the lead communities thrive so basically following up with the tagline there people understand what's needed in their communities better than anyone and i guess we've been trying to put that into practice over the last few years and if you're observing you'll notice that it's stuck on a banner behind my head as well so it's kind of all over our branding and all that sort of thing um this was kind of a distillation of things that we already thought were good and that people had told us they thought was good um, and it's kind of as a, as a guide for us to do things in the future and so today I want to talk to you a little bit about how we've gone about funding work that is kind of led by people it's people-led and also to some extent how we've gone about trying to make ourselves more people-led which is absolutely a work in progress so starting off with funding work that's people-led and this is something that kind of cuts across all levels of our funding. We fund, we make grants um, from 300 quid to million pounds plus. And, and this is something that's kind of percolated through everything that we fund. Um, it, it's something we've also done, ex we've done explicitly for a while um, before it was even enshrined in that kind of, in, in the document that shall not be named. Um, but it's now something we do pretty much across the board in Scotland in particular. Um, and at all levels of our funding, as I say. So what, what do we mean by people-led? Basically, we're talking about involving the people who benefit in the design, development, and delivery of projects. That's what we want to see people that are applying to us for funding doing. And by the people who will benefit, I guess we're talking about people who will be the direct, directly taking part in projects, their networks, maybe their family, friends, carers, and just the wider community that they work within. So we've actually, we've had some funds that I suppose are more directly built on this idea of being people led. Our, our place fund was, is a great example where we set up sort of one to two million pound pots of funding address, addressing um, a plan that was kind of put together and co-produced with the local community. And, and basically they generated project ideas that were then that were then put to us for funding um, and that's something that's been running for many years now we're in, in we're kind of near the end of our second second round of it so I think that's seven eight years at least that's been running um, our young start fund um, is specifically built up around young people being the, in the lead and we generally fund projects that are heavily led and influenced by by young people themselves and then we've got a, a number of funds that like our community led fund, our community assets fund, which um, closed about a year and a half ago, and the Scottish land fund that we run for the government, all of which are built around ownership um, by local community organizations and being led by the local community um, in terms of building a, a building, buying some land, 
running activities, whatever the, that thing may be, it's around local geographic communities and being and it's fundamental to getting money from any of those funds that you're led by the local people that you work with. And as I say, the amounts of funding there vary from kind of 10,000 up to a million. So one wee example um, that we funded through a couple of those funds, um, the hub in Fault House, uh, which is we helped the local community buy it and, and refurb it. Um, and we've also helped them more recently run activities kind of by and for local people. And they're fantastic at, at working in dialogue with the local community. They mostly are community members themselves that run it. And they have regular chats with locals. They, they run a newsletter that gets posted through every, every door in the whole village. Um, they've done lots of different consultation and work and stuff like that. And that's the sort of thing we're talking about and have been trying to impress upon people to get our funding. As I say, applies to our other, fu other funds as well. Um, our smallest and most popular grant, National Lottery Awards for All. Um, a few years back, we introduced the need for everybody who applies to show how they've involved their community, because there were times when, frankly, we'd get applications and say, well, that sounds great, but have you spoken to anyone else about getting involved? And they go, oh, no, which is a little bit shocking to us. Um, and similarly to, to our main sort of thematic funds, like our Improving Lives Fund, we ask people to show that they um, have considered the, their, their users and have involved their users although probably not to the same extent as some of those, those previous ones. A quick blast through some of the things we've learned from this approach. Um, most people generally like it um, and agree with it. The overall message from the sector has been positive. Um, many groups work this way already, so they just like to see that same being reflected in, in what funders are looking for. So that's that's been a real positive. It's definitely open to interpretation. It's quite a broad thing, what makes something people-led and what makes something not people-led, um, both within ourselves in terms of between different funding officers. And I know we've got at least one of our funding officers here today who might be able to attest to that. Um, but also with some groups consider themselves in, in incredibly people led, but then um, when we maybe have talked to them a bit more compared to other people we fund, they, they perhaps aren't. Um, so there's a bit of difference of understanding about what that means. Um, so the, the good thing about that though, is that we don't think this can be one size fits all. So, being people-led in one arena can be quite different to in another. Um, for example, as a local community group, it may be comparatively straightforward to identify who all the people um, are in your community. And that's kind of what the next point is. Um, if you're in a village, you know who that community is. Everybody in the village potentially is part of your community um, and you can potentially engage with them. Slightly more difficult with communities of interest and also particularly if they have very, very challenging um, needs um, for example, if, you, if you're working with people with dementia, you, you may be going to have to approach it quite differently um, in terms of how you engage with them um, than you would with, with just a general sample of the population. But what we've seen, which is fantastic, is that some groups have found incredible ways of doing this, um, and we've definitely learned a lot from that. Um, and then finally, it's, and something that's been touched upon earlier about the power dynamics, it's also kind of a challenge to our culture as a funder, um, and sometimes a challenge to our expertise because if we leave it up to the people to decide what they, they want to do, then um, that might not be the same thing that we think they should do. Um, and it's interesting to hear from, um, I, th I think it was Claire who was saying earlier about once you've got a good relationship, then that challenge is welcome. Um, and, and that's definitely something we've, we found too. Um, but when you don't, maybe don't have that relationship, it's a bit more tense. Um, and finally, yeah, it's changed what we fund um, we've probably funded fewer big national organizations and more locally run and led organizations because we've had that criteria. And um, we've also definitely seen that we've pushed some organizations to work a bit differently, including some quite large organizations that we were kind of surprised maybe didn't involve their users in the same way. And they've fed back and been really positive about that. Um, so more of those groups, like I say, harnessing lived experience. Um, and we've also heard a lot more fantastic stories of of users being on a journey through to being involved into running organizations and that sort of thing. And again, that's really that's really incredible to hear and some really empowering stuff going on. Um, I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'll, I'll blast through something that's a bit more um, in a bit more of a work in progress, which is about making ourselves more people led um, and trying to shift, trying to shift the power away, because essentially our money comes from national lottery players who are basically members of the public. Um, and again, it's touching on what something that Jim said, this, this isn't really about us giving, but it doesn't feel like it should be our power to give essentially, um, but, but somehow it is. And we're just, so we're trying to put some of that power back into the hands of the people who generate this money um, and who's really whose money it actually is. 
um, and whose lives it should be improving. Um, handing over the power isn't exactly isn't exactly a new thing to us. We've tried it um, in many ways in the past. We've run funds with young people on the funding committees, sometimes a little bit tokenistic, and we've run public voting projects, which are 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 great, but a bit of a minefield, and sometimes a popularity contest. Um, we've definitely involved local people in, in our work. And that's, as I say, that our replace fund that we've been running for some years is a good example of that. But there's a couple of things, my last sort of couple of slides for today, some new things that we're trying out or newer things that we're trying at the moment. Um, we've got a bit of work at the moment. Looking to make our Young Start Fund more youth led. We've done some service design work around involving young people. I mean, I have a team of people working on how we can involve young people really meaningfully and not tokenistically in the decision making processes in the, the processes of actually applying for grants. So that's an interesting piece of work that's going on. And then something that's probably a bit more widespread um, across our organization is we're getting quite into a bit of participatory grant making. We've run several small participatory grant making funds over the last few years across Scotland, generally in sort of micro grants um, or small grants and generally locality based as well. Um, and we've got eight or so um, funds currently being planned or run in, in small local areas across Scotland. Um, so that's something that we're really, um, we're really somewhat new to, um, but getting, they're getting stuck into at the moment. Um, our learning from that is just, there's a lot to learn. There's, it's, we're not necessarily the experts in this stuff. Um, we're, we may be the experts in funding, but we're not perhaps the experts in community engagement and that kind of thing. So a big, a steep learning curve for us there, definitely. Um, and that's that's why we're rolling things out nice and slow, um, test and learn. Um, Decision-making is only one aspect. That's one thing that we've we've also realized. And that in terms of getting the power out there, often it's about involving the people in creating the processes as well as making the decisions on the end product. Um, and that's something we've been trying out to do more. Um, doing participatory grant making is also a fantastic tool for outreach and engagement. It's helped us reach a lot of new groups, and a lot of new people that maybe wouldn't think of going to a major funder. Um, but then the flip side of that is we have to make sure that it's about them, not about us, that we're not just using this as a tool to, to help us tick some boxes or, or get some goals about reaching out to new communities that we've not funded before, that we're legitimately doing something that's for the good of the actual people that are getting funded. Um, and finally, last point, it's also exposed us, I think, to some of the uncertainty and excitement that our own applicants go through in terms of how they go about shaping their, their projects um, how they go about giving up some of that power to the people they work with and helping that decide what kind of project they might apply for. We're kind of going through that same experience with our with our um, our own funds. So sorry, that's a bit of a whistle stop. Um, that's me done. I can hear the thing, the thing going in the background. I'm sorry, I've gone a minute or two over. Um, if you want to Thanks. give me a shout about any of this stuff, my email address is up on screen. Um, I may not be the person who knows all about it, but I can get you in touch with the person who is. Thanks very much, Alistair. Great. Um, uh, just before we move on to Ginny, um, I see Joanna, Joanna Gilchrist, you have a hand up perhaps. Joanna, I, I need to move on to Ginny, but could you maybe post something in the chat and, and we can try and resolve that if there's an issue? Um, I'm going to move on now to Ginny um, and ask Ginny to do her presentation. Thank you. Ginny. Hi there. I'm going to share our slides straight away um, because we are conscious that we have a lot to get through and don't want to keep you guys any longer. So um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for inviting us to, to come and present today. My name's Ginny Cooper, and this is my glamorous assistant, David, um, who, uh, and, and we work together at Homeless Network Scotland, which is a, a relatively small organization um, based in Glasgow, but covering the whole of Scotland, um, really working on transformational change within the homelessness sector. And a big part of that is uh, through co-production by providing a platform for people with lived experience. Um, so David's gonna give a quick kind of overview of 
where we started and, and where we've we've got to and then i'm going to give um an example of one of the, the programs that we're working with thanks janet I suppose for, for me, I say that to Jenny there, I need to keep this brief for everybody that knows me. You know, I like, I like talking, so I'm going to try and keep this brief. And I've got my notes, so this is going to be really unusual for me. So but I'm going to try my best, right? So what we've learned over the last decade is, as you know, people already have a voice. What we had to offer them as a platform to use that voice. Uh, I'm going to just talk about a couple of the projects that we've been involved in and some of the things that we've done, and then and Jenny, she'll talk about another project and I'll finish off with our final project we're on. So what we've done, facilitated large, small scale conversations just to inform design and practice. The second one that was really good, we supported people with lived experience to deliver citizens advocacy. The project was called Navigate and it looked at co-designing and co-producing. It was the first time I'd been involved in anything like that and, uh, as we're going to, it does take a bit longer, but it was well worth it. So that was people that had been homeless relatively now and relatively late in the past that they were homeless. So getting them involved in designing this, people were coming in that had issues when about benefits and housing issues. And we basically trained people up and supported them to deliver the project. And then the other one we've done is we've trained and supported people to be equal partners and Glasgow's local authority, and that's looking at the alliance. So we've got a, a group called the Gift Glasgow Homelessness Involvement and Feedback Team, get that right. Uh, and that has been equal partners, and that took a lot, a lot of work for Glasgow City Council to actually come to the table. And I suppose, as I've heard people talking about it all day, is the power. So actually for them to actually come and bring people to the table, but, and everybody had an equal vote, that was really important for us. And one of the other ones, we've got all in for change, but I'm not going to talk about that because Jenny has. Uh, the final one done at the very bottom is facilitating a place-based participation. SCDC are involved in it with us as well. It's called Staying In, and I'll get into that at the end. That's basically just getting a whole community together to actually decide how, how funding should be used. It's funded for the big lottery. So as I say, I've been doing this for 10 years. We've learned so much in that time. Uh, and I'm going to just get through some of the learning for us. I often people choice in a range. I think it's really important that, that some people, uh, co-production is a funny thing, I think, because everybody, everybody wants to do different parts of it. So it's just, it's important that, that, that we're clear about that when we're delivering delivering projects. Some people want to just share a story, other people want to learn, other people want to influence policy. And I think it's just important that, that we, we give everybody the opportunity in a meaningful way. So it's no, no anything that we've not been hearing uh, so, so far. Challenging power dynamics, it's the big one that we always talk about. Uh, I think for us as an organisation, we've got to the stage now that, uh, that we're after doing this for a wee while, everybody's voice is just as valuable. Uh, nobody can come and bring the trump card because I've got experience of homelessness or I've got an addiction background, whatever it is. People that have been working in this field for a long time, I've got so much value to offer as well. So we, we need to make sure that, that that's also on the table. No, Because I think when I started doing this sort of work, I was very, I was aware that and people had lived the experience that sometimes other people didn't feel a they felt a wee bit they couldn't sort of I'm not saying challenge but they couldn't couldn't have the same input as them. Uh, so it was really important for us that we, we we scrapped all that and actually get everybody to start off for, for the one I suppose the one spot and a shared understanding of moving forward. So I think again I've just said it there it's about just laying the groundwork so everybody knows where we're starting for. Uh, and I think that's that's one of the, the things that I'm 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 really interested in. It's like getting people to actually understand when I think for us anyway, when you're doing this, you, you can do this at any time. Even if you have no co-produced something for the very beginning, it doesn't mean you can't involve people through it, the project or whatever it is you're doing. So I think that's really important that, that if you're not doing it, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. You can start doing it halfway through the project. Anytime you spot any opportunities, uh, 
that's our advice to people is make sure that you take them, make sure you involve people right through the project, even if you've not done it for the start. And I think also, don't be scared to take things like this on. It does take a lot longer, uh, but it's worth it because I think you get a more richer and valued uh, approach when you're looking at co-production. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Jenny now. Double act here, double act. <laughs> strange having to present on a screen when there's two people in the room, but we'll try it. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about one of our programmes called All In For Change. Um, this is one example, as David kind of showed many other examples about how, how we use co-production to create um, a collaborative and inclusive approach to, to ending homelessness. So it's driven by a change lead of people from across the country, um, and they're bringing together their unique experiences to lead the change um, that is needed to end homelessness in Scotland. Homelessness Scotland have been co-facilitating this program along with Cyrenians and SCDC since late 2019. So we see it as a relatively new partnership where there's um, obviously still a lot to learn. So why was the program set up? Um, we believe that Scotland will only develop and deliver the best policies to end homelessness when people with personal and professional experiences are involved. In Scotland, we have great policy and legislation when it comes to housing and homelessness, but where more ne work needs to be done is ensuring these policies and legislations can be implemented in practice. One way to do this is by bridging that gap um, between people making the decisions and those who are affected by those decisions. All In For Change unifies uh, people to communicate a common goal by providing more clarity and by building momentum. So united effort and action, All In For Change is driven by people. Um, the change team are experts in what homelessness looks like on the ground, bringing together a diverse knowledge of people with both lived experience, but also those who are working in support and advisory roles on, on the front line. Um, that they have a common drive um, for action-led change. It is important that the change team is made of diverse voices, reflecting many types of people affected by homelessness in Scotland. It's also really important that the change team are well connected so that they can represent the voices of people who aren't usually present at the table. It, it needs to go further than the 30 people that, that are in the group. So the High Level Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan recommended 49 actions uh, needed to end homelessness in Scotland. The change team have since created um, our four new directions and their purpose is to create a clear message around what needs to happen to make change, um, what needs to happen to make change happen in, in homelessness policy and practice. To ensure that the change team can help encourage the changes needed on the ground, they ask and then act on four things, and these can be seen here. What do I need to know about the four new directions? Who will I tell about the four new directions? What will I do differently to help embed the new directions in practice? And what will help me to do this? So the change team meet on a monthly basis to prioritize key messages so that these can be fed back to the people that need to hear them. Here you'll see some examples of priorities that were raised during the pandemic. We've been meeting online since the lockdown, um, which has created a, a few challenges as it has, I'm sure for many of you. Um, we've had a few of our frontline change leads drop out because um, of increased pressures at, at work. Some of the group were not confident using digital platforms and emailing to meet, communicate, which meant that we needed to give them more support to make sure that their voices were heard. Um, we had planned to take the change team on a nationwide in-person roadshow um, so that we could reach as many people as possible and talk to them about the four new directions. And this, of course, has been postponed. So despite these things, um, we are pleased that we've managed to continue meeting um, during lockdown and we've provided digital devices to those people who needed them and modified our meetings and we continue to modify our meetings um, to, to meet online. 
The change team are gaining attraction from key people working to end homelessness within Scotland and the public and voluntary sector. Um, off, our members often get asked to join focus groups and are represented on various high level strategy groups. Members have also participated in conferences and hosted webinars and been asked to consult on new policies such as the homelessness prevention duty. One of our change leads is now working as policy officer on secondment at Scottish Government. One of the biggest challenges that we've had, and I appreciate that we're now at 10 minutes, so uh, this is the, the last comment I'll make, um, to, to kind of end on a challenge, but I think a positive challenge, is um, people's misunderstanding, I guess, that the, the change team is a group of people who only bring experience from being homeless themselves. And I think it's really important to highlight the, the combin it's, it's that it's the combin combined experiences of people with both lived experience and frontline experience that makes this group different and a true example of co-production. Um, every, every individual's voice matters and the kind of group's co collective voice is, is really powerful. Said it was the last thing and it's not um so just to say that kind of the, the way that we communicate um a lot of the things that are discussed um in our meetings is by creating um monthly briefings and reports and this is really with an emphasis of creating a clear message not making it like a bogged down report that we see so often when when we're trying to change things within policy so that it's accessible for everyone taking the temperature was the latest report we we created and we can share a link for that um, after this presentation. David, I don't know whether we've got time to talk about staying in. <laughs> can you do it in two yes, seconds? Yes, I can do it. So <laughs> if staying in, you can do uh, it in two, David. Please do it. It's a national lottery funded project, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're speaking about it because Alistair was just on the phone. So SCDC are evaluating it and we're working with Unity. We're in two areas in Glasgow. We've got a community chest for each area. We're we're working with trailblazers in each community, building up a panel of local stakeholders and for them to decide where the money should be getting spent, what projects should be getting funded. And this is to prevent homelessness. We're funding six projects, three in each area, and we're evaluating it at the moment. And the idea is that we'll hopefully start looking at the Scottish government funding this moving forward. It's a bit like people will know it's community budget and a participatory budgeting, but this time it's focusing on housing. So it's a great project. Susan will tell you that, the SCDC. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get that in there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, both of you. Um, really good stuff there about how you're doing that and uh, how Alistair's looking at how you get funding. Think interesting things you both talked about there about being being better at coping with being uncomfortable or being scared or not being scared, as it were. Um, so good stuff. Uh, going to put you in, back into your breakout rooms now. Um, again, the same two questions as we asked you earlier. This time, thinking about what you've heard from Alistair and Ginny and David. Um, what do you think? What do you make of what you've heard? And do you have any particular um, challenges and issues or opportunities that you see for yourself. Uh, I'm going to give you until five past three. We've just run on, we're running a wee bit late, and then bring you back then so that we've still got a decent time for questions back to all our presenters. So um, see you in 15 minutes, people.
Hi everyone. Um, I know some people have had to go, so I'm just wanting to do a double check here with colleagues that we do have everyone back together. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, a wee reminder too, perhaps just to help with sound, if you're not speaking, um, it might help just to keep your camera off if we can, apart from possibly or probably the presenters who we're going to put some questions to here. So thank you all very much. Um, uh, good to see you back again. Uh, we've, we've had a few questions that have come up through the Mentimeter. Thank you very much for using that. We do have a couple about training. Um, what kind of training are people doing and what, do the, what does the training focus on? I'm going to suggest that perhaps people might post um, some information on that in the chat um, and just allow us to focus on some other questions. Um, either if you can do that now in the chat or post the event, if you can share what, what training you're doing, what's, what, what you're focusing on there. And I think this is training maybe of community members and building capacity and skills there. So please, if you could do that um, after the event, that'd be great. But let me come to then a question about skills on the staff side, as it were. There's a question here about what, what do people think are the skills needed to be doing this work and doing it well? And maybe I could pose that initially to David and Ginny. You, you certainly can, yeah. especially as you <laughs> pre-warned us. Thank you very much. Um, Again, very difficult doing this together, but I'll let David start and then I'll uh, fill in the gaps. I think one of the things I said, and people might jump in and go, ah, it's not a skill. But for, for us it is, it's actually been open, open to learning about new ways of working and also being able to put the right people in the right places. I think that's really, really keen, keen key to deliver new stuff. If it's new stuff to, to people, especially in communities or whatever it is, if you've got great new great ideas and, and you put the wrong person in front of people, it just falls and it's flat in its face. So for me, it's putting the right people in the right places. Mm. Okay, thanks. I think, oh, Jenny? I might add us a bit. Um, I guess I, I echo what um, David said around, you know, working with the skills of, of the people you're, you're co-producing with, understanding what their skills are and really helping them to kind of excel <coughs> those things. And that's been really challenging during lockdown because we haven't been able to kind mm -hmm. of learn as, as much with people and there have been restrictions with digital and and all of that i think there's something to be said around um partnership working and and understanding the combination of skills that different um organizations bring um and also i think about understanding that this is not about you it's it's about the people that you're co-producing with and therefore knowing when to step back and allowing them to be leading the the kind of direction but that and that you're really just project managing and um, supporting and providing any kind of additional kind of padding that that might be needed to to make kind of those uh, uh decisions and directions kind of be be made um yeah that's that's all i've got <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you very much. Just, just quickly, Alistair or Jim, do you do you want to add anything from a funder perspective there? Paul, I guess. Sorry, yeah. Go for Alistair. Okay. Right, Alistair. Then Jim. I, I was just going to say, remind, remind me of the question. Um, it was a question about what what do people feel are the key skills that staff need to do co-production, do it well. Right. I mean. I'd, very, very briefly, the, the things that came up from our from our discussion actually were kind of about flexibility and how mm -hmm. uh, the, the ability to uh, still see the value in, in their jobs, especially of people that are like the decision makers within funders, um, that they can feel this is a threat to their the, the sort of the thing that not most people aren't aren't unhappy about the power being taken away, but maybe they're they're worried about the, the expertise being they feel maybe undermined, especially if they've been mm. in that job for a long time and they, they've maybe internalized that that way of working. Um, it, it can okay. feel threatening to them. And so I think being flexible and, and being supported and being told, no, we this is why we still value you. Um, yeah. That's not a skill they need to have. It's maybe something you need to have in the organization and uh, making people think okay. about where what their value is. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Jim, do you want to add anything? Well, uh I think it's um, fundamentally about confidence and know-how mm -hmm. and, and curiosity. 
I think once we in the funding world see how powerful and effective these approaches are, um, uh, people want to do it and do it well. And um, I think it can feel daunting, but my sense is unpack it, start small, don't mm -hmm. overclaim. Um, and there's been so much of that today about pilot working, yeah. uh, trying it out in a few places, making mistakes, being honest about it, transparency, yeah. all that stuff. Great. Thank, thank you both. Um, I, I mean, there's a number of issues in there we will capture from today and in a report, I'm sure. Um, the, the Another question we had was about, um, and again, this is probably directed at you, Jim and Alistair, how do you funders define um, and measure people-led? Maybe, Jim, if you can go first this time. How do you define and measure people-led? Currently, we don't, Paul, is the honest answer. OK. What we do have in our decision frames across all of our themes um, are references, our frames, if you like, around relationships, rights, community, and collaboration. Mm -hmm. So there are some pretty promising building blocks, if you like, or roots of what will become a more fully fledged participatory people led approach. We're, we're, we're not there yet, but okay. we've got enough in play that is attracting some brilliant practice. Homeless Network yeah. Scotland are one of our partners, Street Soccer Scotland, Poverty Truth Community, and so on. Um, uh, we are going to learn from them and do more of it in time. Right. OK, great. Thanks, Jim. Alistair? I mean, in terms of how we define it for ourselves as an organisation, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's something that we're similar to Jim, we're, we're still kind of working on. Um, in terms of how we define it for the people we fund, it, it really probably does come down to those, those sort of three things I mentioned that, that start, all start with the D, um, involving people in the, the right from the start in the, in the, the design, then mm -hmm. the development and then the delivery of what uh, an organisation is doing. So they've got people that they work with involved right the way through from coming up with the idea, specking out the idea and then yeah. doing the thing. Um, and that and that being a kind of a constant loop that they do for us, that's a strong people led organization that, that's doing those things. And that varies depending on what type of work you're doing and what type mm -hmm. of people that 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 they're working with. Um, you might not be able to involve certain people in the same way as you involve others. So there's not necessarily also one size fits all model that we sure. apply to. Um, but but those factors, I think, remain the same regardless of, of who you're dealing with. OK, OK. Th thank you both. I mean, certainly it struck me that it was very much the outward facing one, but also how you work as an organisation yourselves in your own right. That's quite important there. I'm going to switch tack a wee bit here because we had a couple of questions about resources um, and tools that people could access and are available. And I'm wondering if I can bring in one of my colleagues here from the SEDC, Susan, perhaps, just to talk about um, what we have, what the network has, and um, how people might access those, Susan? Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> I was just mindful that we have a collection of resources on the co-production site. Um, so I've just posted the link for that and would encourage you to have a look. It's a kind of collection of blogs, stories, tools, frameworks. Um, and I've also noticed that there's some other links that have been posted in the chat from other sites that offer kind of similar things, but different things. So the reality is there's a variety uh, of resources around uh, co-production. So hopefully those will be good sources for you to dig in a bit deeper to see if there's something of interest there. <clears throat> and there was a there was a suggestion or, or a question around what kind of resource might be most helpful to use for people at the start of their co-production journey. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've found really helpful is a thing called the co-production project planner which has been developed by IRIS. Um, it's been around for a few years now, and they've actually developed a number of resources around that. So I'm going to just quickly post the link to that in the chat. OK, great. Uh, that's a really good one for, for people. Um, in fact, not just if you're starting your co-production journey, but it helps you map out what that might look like in practice. So it's a really good detailed resource. Okay. Good. Many thanks, Susan. I'm going, to, I'm going to come to what people might think is a bit of a wicked question. But I think it's a really important one. And, and there's two aspects to this that have been asked. Um, one is, how do you know and recognise bad practice and how do you call it out? 
And related to that was a question here about how do you protect the concept from being misused or abused? Um, and that's a question for all the panel. Maybe I'll start, um, come back to you, Ginny and David, any thoughts on that? How do you call out bad practice and how do we prevent this idea of being used for the wrong purposes and misused in different ways? Ginny, David? Yeah. <laughs> I know how I'd call it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, maybe, that, maybe, maybe that, that wouldn't get us too far. Uh, no, no, I'm only joking. I think for us, for uh, the only thing that we can honestly do in it is using the evidence that we've got. Always reverting back to the evidence that we've built up over however long we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and trying to then influence individuals. That, I mean... Listen, everybody knows me, knows the way I work, you know what I mean? I don't, I'm not a shouter or a baller or anything like that. I'm a sit down and let's chat about things and then try and, try and work out and yeah. see where the differences are and then try and use whatever evidence and knowledge that I have in the organisation and the wider networks to try and then get individuals to maybe start thinking about what they're doing that might... I mean, a lot of people are doing it, Paul, and they see it as yeah. it's the right thing to do and they think... And it, yeah, yeah. You can't take that away from people. Do you know what I mean? That's the mm -hmm. passion. So to get to get in there and actually change a passion, it takes a lot of trust and relationship yeah. building. So I think that's that's the way I, I certainly okay. leave it. Okay. I don't know what Jenny would say, but that's right. Thanks, yeah, David. I, th I think it, bring, it brings back that point about being person led. And I think um, to identify whether your program personally is 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 um, bad practice. I guess it, it's about asking the people who are involved, um, making sure that there are spaces for evaluation and learning and reflection, mm -hmm. and that everybody is is part of that. And l making sure that if if things are being highlighted through that learning, changes are being made towards better better practice. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you both said there. Um, let, let me come to Alistair and then Jim. Um, anything you want to add, Alistair? Yeah, it's actually something we talked about in our breakout session briefly. And again, we're probably talking about it more in terms of um, sniffing it out um, among people who are, who are applying for, for funding. In, in that case, I guess that's more of our experience at the moment. And, and definitely the, there was a few folk in, in the chat who'd seen this these terms being maybe sort of weaponized by, right. by fundraisers to try and to try and access funding um but but when you dug in behind it there wasn't there wasn't really much to it um yeah. and I, I know one of our funding officers chris is here today and he was talking about how his his way around that is literally to go out and see what they do go out and uh, and and visit them see right. how they work with the, with the people they work with um, okay. That's quite resource intensive, but it but it has been quite effective for us, and it definitely means you can sniff out those and okay. um, those those full production that, as was just put into the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Bef before I come to you, Jim, I know one or two people do want to come in. Could I could I maybe ask you if you can post the question here, please, if you can, um, and and that way we can try and manage our time. Sorry, um, Jim. Thanks, Paul. Um... I'm mindful of a blog that was written last year by a woman called Caroline Kennedy, who uh -huh. uh, was previously with a volunteer with Poverty Truth Community and now with Poverty Alliance. And it was really to the point that Sandra, Sandra McCree had put in the chat about um, people no longer willing to just be a story or just be you know, the lived experience participant in an event that is otherwise unreformed. Um, pe people are fed up with that. People have other aspects to their lives. They have other goals in life than, than just being put on a platform. So I think yeah. we need to always be careful about these terms. They are contested. We should always be looking at what's under the surface and in terms of, so that's about that's about making sure we're we're listening and getting it right. In terms of poor practice, I think some of it is about duplication that masquerades as something new, and duplication in the third sector happens quite a lot, and some of it is potentially harmful because it diverts people away from good, safe, productive practice. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's a different point from misusing co-production, but yeah, yeah. I, th I think we're getting better at spotting unhelpful duplication. Okay, okay. Um, we've got, I think we've got time for maybe just me to put one more question to you. I know there are some other questions and points, some of which I think are people asking for information. So we'll, we'll look at how we pick up on that. Um, uh, but what, one of the, a couple of other questions were about how, how do you help people deal with capacity issues? And I think that was not just a skills issue, that was about time and other resources and so on. And then there was a question too about how do you reach, if you like, how do you bring to bear the voice of the voiceless, those who are really out with perhaps um, circles of engagement? Um, how, do, how do we make sure that we do that wider, broader engagement to reach them and involve them? Um, Ginny and David, any, any thoughts on that? There are two things that are very uh, current in conversations that Homeless Network are, are talking about currently. Um, mm -hmm. The capacity issue, especially with the change team, you know, when, as soon as you've got um, a group of people that are, are willing um, to to lead change and and share their kind of personal experience, yeah. um, everybody wants a, a bite of it, I guess. And um, I, I echo what Jim was saying about, you know, needing to move away from this being just about people obviously sharing their, their lived experience and and more about encouraging people um, to use those experiences to be able to identify how they can can lead that change and and um, mm -hmm. and yeah, form decisions around around things. Um, Again, voice of the voiceless um, in homelessness, that, that tends to be the people who have really been let down by every service, the, the, the yeah. people who, who are rough sleeping. Um, and it, for me, that's about creating the right environments to engage with those people. Um, it's not about expecting people to um, meet us at our level, but, but, but us um, going and meeting them at their level and and doing whatever we can to to make them feel as comfortable and able to to join in the, the discussions. Okay, David, do you want to add anything? Uh, do you know what? I'm going to be brutally honest. Uh, I've been doing this for ten years, and I've been hearing this same things all the time. Uh, it's no, uh, it's I just can't understand why that we've still got people that are voiceless. Do you know what I mean? I still can't get that. We know where they are. Or we know yeah. who they're supposed to be, you know. Well, let's just go to where they are. I mean, it's not rocket science. We all know okay. who they are. We know where okay. people are. So it, I, I just, I, I'm with that. I'm a bit. I'm going to use a big word, Paul. Perplexed for me. Perplexed, right? Yeah, I thought you're going to use um, a different kind of word there. Th thanks. Oh, that's a big word for me, mate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, very briefly, because we're going to have to wind up. Alistair, Jim, anything on that you want to add? Alistair first. Um, I think David just actually took the words out of my mouth. The one thing that was come, coming into my head was you've got to go to where people are, not, mm -hmm. not expect mm -hmm. them to come to you because yeah. they're, they're not going to walk up to you in your ivory tower as a funder and, and, and come up to your boardroom and sit and eat, have yeah. tea and biscuits with you and talk about it. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, I think, same for me, basically. Okay. Jim? So I think there's a responsibility on independent funders because we're not looking over our shoulders at government or local government as our funders mm -hmm. or even the media for that matter <clears throat> to uh, go out and, and, and make connections that otherwise are not being made. I'm noticing in the chat people are talking about being targeted for speaking truth to power and calling out bad practice. That's very, very worrying. And I think, again, independent funders have a particular role to play where statutory funders won't go. Yeah. And I guess um, on the capacity point, um, organisations don't have to do all the heavy lifting themselves. Seek, seek out partners who are doing this well in a way that is yeah. not tokenistic and, and partner with them. Go, go where there is capacity and help to grow it even, even further. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, we, could, we could carry on, I'm sure, for a good while, yeah, but I'm very conscious that we do want to try and finish on time. Um, uh, we'll, we'll capture a lot of this, we're recording this discussion, we'll, we'll capture this and other points people have made in the chat as well. 
Um, I think what I take from what you've all been saying here in the final round of discussion is create the right space, create the right framework, have the right attitudes, be prepared to deal with mess. Um, don't be afraid of being scared, as it were. Don't be afraid of being uncomfortable. Um, um, and, and be prepared to do things and, and make mistakes and learn and be open to learning as well. So um, some really, really crucial things in there. Um, can, I, can I just say that one of the th things we'd like you to do before you finish um, is maybe just feedback in the chat, if you can, everybody. One word just summing up um, what you feel now about having been involved in this event, this experience. Just give us one word back. Um, We'll give you a chance, I'm sure, after the event, if you want to feedback any other more detailed um, views on the event by way of evaluation. But at the moment, if you can just give us one word, um, and we'll, we'll capture that as well in our post-event report. Um, I, I just want to say that it's, the feedback on chat has been really, really positive. That's superb. I realise that doing this kind of event by Zoom is quite limiting in a way. We don't have the same freedom and flexibility with being quite open about chat and so on. So my apologies to people that feel a bit frustrated who maybe wanted just to raise their hand, chuck in, um, but we, we're just trying to manage our time as best we can today in what's quite a challenging, quite an um, ambitious programme. Uh, so I really just want to thank you all for participating. Thank you really very much. I want to particularly thank, though, Jim, from the Robertson Trust, Alistair from the National Lottery, uh, Ginny and David from Homeless Network, and the two players, although they had to go early, it was a bit of a shame because I'm sure they'd have loved to have contributed as well. But really, thank you all very much. Um, and uh, please stay safe and well um, and keep the conversation going. The, the community, the network isn't just about this week. Copro week might figure quite highly just now, but it's an all through the year process of engaging with people, sharing lessons and learning. So we would encourage you, if you want to continue the conversations in any way, you want to make offers of sharing your experience, please get in touch. If you're not signed up already to the network, please do that. Um, and we would love to hear from people how they want to continue this conversation, because quite often what happens is we have a conversation, we stop, we have a break, and it doesn't become an iterative one especially you hear people say, you know, these are issues I've heard for a long, long time. So please keep in touch, stay in touch. Thank you all very much for today and stay safe and well, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.